This is the Rare But Real podcast with Audrey Brogy. Audrey is a pastor's wife, mother, and grandmother who will often be joined by her daughter and daughters-in-law as they discuss what it takes to be a woman of God in these challenging days. For years, young women have grown up with an indoctrination of what womanhood is and what it should be. Yet God still raises up real women in every generation who love Him and want to live for Him. They are rare, but they are real. And now, Audrey Brogy. Father, I am once again so grateful for every woman that um, has been keeping up with the Song of Songs with us, whether in this room and present, and present here in this building and in our small groups, or whether they have been joining us online, live, or whether they have been joining us some through the podcast or YouTube, the Search of Scriptures app, however they're finding us. Father, I'm so thankful for the truth of this book of the Bible, and I thank you that you have given us the the time to study it. I thank you once again for the leadership of this church, for valuing what we do here as women and the way you have called us to build into one another's lives um, and all the while being shepherded um, by the leadership of this church. Father, I'm just so grateful and thankful. Pray that you'd be with us as we conclude our study today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you remember in our first session together, and I suppose I should have called it the prologue, um, but one of the things we saw then was how incredibly important intimacy is between a husband and wife. And we were reminded that God gave the physical union. He's the one who thought it up. It was his idea. And of course, he wants a husband and wife in marriage to enjoy that fully because it is a holy, sacred union. And we learned in that first session that God established boundaries for that physical union, so to protect it. And that boundary is called marriage. And you wouldn't think that we would need to say marriage between a man and a woman, but here we are. This is the day we live in between a marriage, uh, between a man and a woman. That is marriage. And his word reveals his purposes for this union. And we summarize those purposes, which I will share in just a moment. But I do want to say this, and I have it in your handout as you go into your small groups. But, um, you know, the looming concern that comes up from time to time, and I know I addressed it in our first message together very briefly because I didn't want to stay there. I wanted to get to what the Word of God says through the Song of Songs. But so many times women wonder about this book because as we know, we all know that Solomon went on to marry many, many women and he deeply transgressed his own belief and his own, what he believed to be true. He, he transgressed his God. He transgressed his own beliefs. He transgressed his own wife that we've been learning about because we know that he believed in one man and one woman for life. And we see that in Ecclesiastes chapter nine, verse nine, when he's writing. I mean, that's a wonderful book to study too. And you see that what he says is all is vanity. He's just learned so much through his, not only his commitment to the Lord, but through his sin against the Lord. Um, But God still is telling us and revealing to us through the Song of Songs that Solomon's relationship with his first true love, the Shulamite, I mean, he's reminding us of what it's supposed to be like, telling us that before he sinned, before Solomon sinned so greatly by accumulating all these foreign women. And we also know, because the scripture is so plain, and the scripture clearly teaches us that these foreign women turned Solomon's heart after other gods and led him astray, led him to a place where his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God. That's what scripture tells us. And because God tells us that, that should be a warning to every single one of us to keep our hearts close to the Lord. And we will be talking about that even more as we move through today's message. But God's word reveals the purpose for the physical union. And we summar- summarize those purposes like this, procreation. We were made to have babies. This is the way of God. Just plain and simple, that's what the scripture teaches. Genesis 1:28 says, God bless them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living 
living thing that moves on the earth. And of course, we talked about how that's called the creation mandate, ever before sin entered the world. Yet, when sin did enter the world, God did not change his mind. He did not change his ways after man sinned. And God repeated this command to Noah when he and his family left the ark, when they got off. He said this in Genesis 9, verse 1. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And we talked about in that first session how a lot of young Christian couples think that they can decide on their own not to have children. They just think they're in charge of it. They take their fertility for granted. They think they'll be uh, their own God in that area. But children, the scripture tells us and shows us through throughout God's word, they're the outward expression of that union between a husband and a wife. A child is a re reflection of that. Um, you know, we, you know, like mom's eyes, dad's nose, mom's skin, dad's height, whatever it is, one flesh, characteristics of these two people rolled into one. And Christians should not choose deliberate childlessness, just on their own. No, Christians pray, quit, Christians seek God, Christians understand what the what the um, what God teaches about the blessing of children. Ch uh, Christians desire to raise a godly heritage, and if they end up childless, they trust God in this. And it's not our place to judge other people because we're not God. We don't know. We don't know what God is up to in people's lives. We don't know the circumstances. So we understand God's principles, and then we walk in that in our own uh, walk before the Lord. The the second purpose of this union that we learned is it's to fulfill a God-given desire. The Apostle Paul recognized this, and he affirmed this as a legitimate desire. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 3 to 5, the husband must fulfill his duty to his wife, and likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does, and likewise also the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Stop depriving one another, except by agreement for a time so that you may devote yourself to prayer and come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. We learn that as a married couple, that married couples need to come together regularly, and if they are not doing that, they are disobeying God. 1 Corinthians um, chapter 7, verse 9. But if they do not have self-control, let them marry, for it's better to marry than to burn with passage, uh, pa uh, passion. In these passages, though, um, it's clear that God not only allows physical intimacy, but he also commands it. That's what we see here. Um, then we also learned that God states uh, another purpose for this union, and that's in Genesis 2, verse 24. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So really, the third purpose of physical intimacy in marriage is for the bonding of the man and the woman. It's that physical bond, but yet it's also a spiritual bond. It is an act of worship. We learn that. Something about it represents complete union, and God uses that union to preserve and unify a couple, a man, the husband totally and completely giving himself to his wife and the wife totally and completely giving herself to her husband in a way that he or she gives to absolutely no one else. God gave it th this uh, unique power to unify. And it is a mystery. Scripture tells us that it's a mystery. And in a healthy marriage, when physical intimacy is a regular part of the union, trust grows, commitment deepens, and the two become one in the deepest levels of their being in this God-honoring act of worship. And I shared, you know, in that first message how I learned the facts of life, and I asked you how you learned. And at the end of the message, I said this, there's not one of us in this 
this room or who's listening to me that hasn't been tainted by sexual sin, in some way we've all compromised, maybe with our physical bodies, maybe what's going up here in our minds, maybe what's going on in here with our hearts, maybe with what we're looking at with our eyes. And I asked you if you wanted that to change, if you really want God's ways in this area of your life. Because see, here's the thing, before this study and all these weeks that we've spent together can really take on its intended purpose, we have to be honest with God about our past sins. We have to admit them to him. We have to tell him. We have to confess our sins to him so that he, because he, the word says he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so again, that begs another question. Have you, past tense, now that we've reached the end, have you been honest with God during this study? As, as this study has progressed, has your attitude changed? Has your heart changed? Have, have you made some real differences in your life? Have you changed or are you still just the same? Now, this book, as we know, is more than just a love story between a husband and a wife, though it is that. It represents, though, the ultimate love story of all, and that is between Christ and his bride. You see it all over the book. You remember how the Shulamite felt at the beginning of the book? We titled that first chapter, Young Love. She wanted him to kiss her with the kisses of his mouth, yet she had this problem. She saw herself as unworthy, as ugly, as nothing, as swarthy. But the king took notice of her, and really for her to appreciate what he wanted to do for her, she needed to see herself this way. Because see, if she were some kind of self-righteous and arrogant girl who thought she was the greatest gift uh, to earth, if, if she called herself the princess, she would not have responded to the king in the way that she did. But she knew she was just a poor country girl. She knew she was swarthy and that she was ugly and that she didn't deserve anything. And women, this girl's description of herself is really a picture of you and it's a picture of me because we're all poor country girls. We're all swarthy. We're all ugly. You know, we're all, as the Bible describes, dead in our trespasses and sins, darkened by the sin of this world, hopeless, helpless, no way out of our circumstances unless the king takes notice of us, until he looks at us, until he draws us. I mean, listen to the, these words of the Lord in Ephesians chapter 2. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. I mean, just think about that. He's saying, he's describing you, he's describing me, that we were dead in our trespasses and sins. So sometimes we don't think we're all that bad. We don't think we're as bad as somebody else. We don't think we can transgress as bad as some of these people that we read about on the news. But we can because he tells us, we formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. And then verse three, he says, among them, we too all formerly lived, and how does he say we lived? In the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. That's what God says about us. But then he goes on, he says, but God. God. And then he describes God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. Even when we were dead in our transgressions, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Then there's this verse, for by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works so that no one may boast. Because y'all, you know, that's what we like to do. Well, I was raised like this or I would never do that or I did this and I did that. He says, no, it's not a result of our works. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we should 
would walk in them. Good works are part of the equation, but not in terms of salvation. It's just once you, once God saves you, he's created you for good works. He's created you to do those things because it's proof that you're saved, but it's not a means of your salvation. Romans 3 says this in verse 10, as it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. That includes me. There's not one of us. That's what he's saying. That's how God is describing us. Verse 13, their throat is an open grave with their tongues. They keep deceiving. The poison of asp is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths. In the path of peace they have not known, there is no fear of God before their eyes. Y'all, he's describing us before we're saved. We may not have gone it's deep into our depravity in, our, in terms of outward acts, as we, but we could. That's the thing he's showing us there. He's showing us that there's no room in God's economy to think that we're anything but swarthy. We are not princesses who deserve nothing but the best. We have no right to arrogance. We have no right to self exaltation. We can't even say that we, not really, that we were searching for God. I mean, I know we say that, but if we were searching for God, it's because God was first searching for us. It's because he caused our searching. I mean, God takes the initiative. He takes notice. He's the one who looks at us. And on our own, we're headed straight to hell. And that's the truth of God's word. Romans 6, 23 says, for the wages of sin is death. Remember the garden? Remember what God told Adam? The Lord God commanded the man saying, from any tree of the garden, you may eat freely. But from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat from it, you will surely die. And turn the page, and what did they do? They disobeyed. They did exactly what God said not to do. They sinned. They ate from the tree. And God's word was true. They died two deaths. The first was physical on the outside. They were going to die now. The bodies that God so carefully and skillfully wove together would physically die. It would hurt and suffer pain and deteriorate. The illnesses we face are a reminder of this. The cuts, the bumps, the bruises, all a reminder of this. Every funeral we go to, a reminder of this. Every sorrow that accompanies that funeral, a reminder of this. And it wasn't supposed to be this way, but the wages of sin is death. And as bad as physical death is, the second death is even worse. They died spiritually on the inside. The soul and spirit that was supposed to be in constant communion with God, able to enjoy his presence, now separated from the Lord. It happened. We got what we deserved. And God warned us, the wages of sin is death. But you know what? We learn from that verse in Romans that it doesn't end there. Just like God didn't end it all with Adam and Eve when they deliberately and willfully chose to sin. The next part of the verse says this, verse 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift, there's that but again, just like we saw in Ephesians chapter two, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So what do you see here? The Bible gives us the bad news for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death, but he also gives us the good news. The free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And Romans 3 explains even more. Verse 24, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed for the de demonstration, I say, of his righteousness in the present time so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Y'all, this is such wonderful news. Though we are separated from God 
though we are headed for a Christless eternity, though we are swarthy, though we are nothing, though we do not seek God on our own, though we are his enemies, he's, the, he's just and he's the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Do you have faith in Jesus? Romans 5 verse 10 says, for if while we were enemies, that's what he says, if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. I mean, this is tremendous. God takes notice of me and he invites me into his kingdom to share with me all the riches of his grace to make me his girl, to make you his girl. He invites you. And because of all of this, what should our response be? We should be so in love with him. Not like he's our cosmic boyfriend, but he's the king of kings. And like the Shulamite, we, would, we should say, draw me after you and let us run together. I don't want to be a loose woman. I want to be with you. I want to live my life for you. I want to glorify my Father who is in heaven. I want to be identified with him. And you know what else God tells us in his word? If we belong to him, he tells us that he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. That's Ephesians 1 verse 3. He tells us that we have an inheritance with him, not made with hands, but eternal in the heavens. That's 2 Corinthians 5 verses 1 to 10. And then remember chapter 2? We titled it Wherever She Is because that reflected the heart of the king. And it's true of the king of kings. He wants to be with you. He wants to have fellowship with you. If you belong to him, if you've come into that relation, you've trusted in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, and you've responded to his invitation, and you've trusted in him, he not only wants you to be in that right relationship with him, but he wants to have fellowship with you. And here, what we saw in the song is that the king was not ashamed of his bride. Remember, his banner over her was love. And the same is true of our Lord. If you belong to him, he is not ashamed of you. He's not ashamed to call you his friend, his sister. That's what Hebrews chapter 2 tells us. Verse 9 says this, But we do see him who was made for a little while lower than the angels, namely Jesus, because of the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting for him for whom are all things and through whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory. I mean, don't you just love that? Bringing many sons to glory. I mean, that's what he wants to do. That's what he does. To perfect the author of their salvation through sufferings for both he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified. So he who sanctifies, that's Christ. He who sanctifies and those who are sanctified, that's us, are all from one father for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Saying, I will proclaim your name to my brethren. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children whom God has given me. If you belong to him, you're his child. And he's not ashamed of you. And so the bigger question for you and for me, and I think I've I asked this numerous times through this study, are we ashamed of him? Are we reluctant to be identified with him? Even as it gets harder in this culture in which we live to be identified as a Christian, to, to be one of those born-agains, to be one of those fundamentalists who really believe in the fundamentals of the faith. I mean, how about you, teenager? How about you, college-age girl? What about you? Are you afraid or ashamed to be, declare yourself as belonging to Christ, being his? Embarrassed maybe to say you're a Christian? Embarrassed to stand on the word of God? Too cool to be called his? And not just teens and college girls, this goes for young women, this goes for middle-aged women, this goes for old women. 
But here's the thing, God's not ashamed of you. He's for you. He takes care of you even when you shout at him. He takes care of you even when you complain to him and when you slander him. And when you ignore him for days or weeks, when you entertain yourself with things that he doesn't want you to entertain yourself with, when you fill your mind with all kinds of things that he calls an abomination, when you commit spiritual adultery, he's faithful to you. And he remains faithful to you even when you cheat on him because you belong to him. And then in chapter three, we called it going to the chapel. And that's what the, the king and his bride did. You remember after the bride's fear of losing him, he came to get her with his elaborate carriage, with his men, with his crown, and his heart rejoiced. And I said at the end of that message, if you're married, I can guarantee that on the day of your wedding, your husband's heart rejoiced on that day. He found his woman and you found your man. But then I said, is your husband's heart still rejoicing because he married you? Whether you've been married five years, 10 years, 20 years, 40 years, 50 years, is he still rejoicing? And then let's think about that further. Is the way you treat him and live your life next to him as his wife satisfying to him? Does he smile when he thinks of you? Does he look forward to coming home to you? And those questions are good questions that those of us who are married need to ask ourselves. But let's take it further. The greater questions are these. Does your life make the Savior rejoice? We know he loves us. We know he's faithful to us. We know he saved us. We know he rejoices in us. But what I'm really asking is this, is the way you treat him and live your life as his bride satisfying to him. Could he sit next to you on your sofa and watch what you watch? Could he scroll, watch you scroll your phone? Or could you sit next to him and ask him to enjoy it with you? See, if we really love him, if we really want to bring enjoyment to him, we will obey him and stop making excuses for our sinful choices. Then chapter four, that took us to the wedding night. And it was there we saw the king tell his bride how lovely she was. Remember that? And in, and in the middle of his love song to her, taking special note of her body, I took you to Ephesians 5, um, verses 22 to 33. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh. I mean, you, you hear what he said? No one ever hated his own flesh. No one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ also does the church, because we are members of his body. I mean, y'all, this fits so beautifully with the mystery of Christ and his bride, the church. I mean, we see it throughout scripture. We are his body and Christ cares about his body. He loves us as we've learned no matter what we do, but he has every right to be concerned about his body, to correct his body, to get, his, to get the body back on the right track, to call out things that are wrong. He has every right 
And then verse 31, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great, but I'm speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife, even as himself, and the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. So I asked you, do you respect him? Or do you call him an idiot? Or sometimes worse than an idiot? But then again, more importantly, do we respect the Lord Jesus Christ? Of course, of course we say we do, but do we? I mean, think about this, ladies. How, you know, how, how common is it in our culture, even among believers, to use the phrase OMG? Now, I'm not going to say it, <laughs> but just use it flippantly. I mean, we hear it so much. You know, sometimes the more you, when you hear stuff, it's like harder not to repeat it. But unless we're saying that as a prayer to the Lord, that shows him no respect. Respect. We are to respect the one who bought us with a price. And then chapter five, we titled that chapter, Where Did Their Love Go? And this is where we saw the bride cool down in her affection for her husband. They've been together for some time. We don't know how long, but, but some time. And apparently she began to take him for granted because yes, that happens in marriage between a husband and a wife who love each other deeply. But of course, we know it also happens in our relationship with the Lord. When God saved you, you were so grateful. You couldn't believe that he would do this. It's like the blinders fell off and you started seeing everything differently. You couldn't believe he was yours. You were enraptured by him, always talking to him, always going to him with your prayers and entreaties. You were reading his love letter to you. You couldn't wait to see what the Bible was going to show you that day or every day. You were looking forward to everything that you were learning. You couldn't wait to hear God's word taught. You couldn't wait to be in church. You couldn't wait to be at a good Bible study or studying it on your own because you were going to learn more about the one who saved you, your Savior. You were so enraptured by him, and it was all you could talk about. In fact, you know, some people around you maybe who were unsaved were like, man, that person went crazy a little bit. I mean, you shared him with your family, your friends. Your whole life changed. But after a while, just like the Shulamite, you began to find him maybe a little bit annoying, you know, with all his demands. He wants me to give that up? his request, that command is in the Bible? I don't like that. So you started avoiding him, no longer spending time in the word, missing church, missing Bible study, thinking about other things kind of like spiritual adultery. And then like the Shulamite, you began to notice that he's gone. Where is he? He's so distant. God just seems so distant. Why doesn't he hear my prayers? Why did he leave? Where did he go? But in reality, for the Christian, we know that if we are, feel far away from God, if we think he's left, he didn't leave. It's because we left. Hebrews 13 verses 5 to 6 says this, For he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. So that we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What will man do to me? Deuteronomy 31 verse 6, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or tremble at them for the Lord your God is the one who goes with you. He will not fail you nor forsake you. Deuteronomy 31 verse 8. The Lord is the one who goes ahead of you. He will be with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. 
Joshua 1, 5, no man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I have been with Moses, I will be with you. I will not fail you or forsake you. And of course, we all know Psalm 139, or at least I hope you do, that talks about how we can't escape the Lord. God doesn't leave us. He will never leave. It's you and me who leave. We are the wanderers. We're the ones who are prone to wander. That's us. You know, <laughs> my mom has, my mom and dad always had cats. We had them when I was growing up and they've had them, you know, I've never known them without cats. And my mom, as y'all know, passed away in December and at her farm, though, there's still two cats there, her cats, and we've been taking care of them, and the neighbor, you know, across the street still feeds them, and I go to the, to the farm frequently, and I take care of them and pet them, but one of them is, is one, his name is Tabs, and he's been there forever, and he was like, you know, it's just taken care of by my mom, but then there was this other cat who showed up a number of years ago. I don't even know how old this cat is. But I remember my mom saying, I can't like take on taking care of another cat. And this cat would not even let her pet him, her, him or her, I don't know what it is, <laughs> but wouldn't get near, but was always coming. And you know what she calls, called that cat? Stray. That's the cat's name, the Tabs and Stray. I still can't pet Stray. I go there and I say, hey, Stray. And Stray looks at me, but doesn't come close. And I know Stray's a wanderer because he's fat. And my neighbor across the street, I said, who does Stray belong to? He says, well, we just decided he just wanders all over the neighborhood. He's not loyal to anybody. He just goes where there's food. And that's kind of the way we are. <laughs> We're strays. <laughs> we just are prone to wander and we just go wherever. We're not loyal. So often we're just not loyal. But God is loyal to us. And, and, you know, he writes in Revelation chapter 2, I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance that you cannot tolerate evil men. And you put to the test those who call themselves apostles. And they, and they are not. And you found them to be false. And you have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake and have not grown weary. Now here Christ is commending them. He knows they've worked hard. He knows they've persevered. He knows they've spoken against evil men and that they were sound in doctrine, able to recognize false teachers. He also knew that they were believers who had endured so much and they had not grown, re grown weary in enduring those things and in their service to the Lord. They were sincere and they had been that way for years. They were ab an admirable group of believers. Yet God said this, verse four, but I have this against you, that you have left your first love. See, in spite of all their greatness in the faith, God rebuked them. He said, I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. He's talking about the deepest kind of love there is, the kind that God has for his people. Remember what Paul wrote to the Ephesians years before? He says, for this reason, I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus, which exists among you and your love for all the saints, do not cease giving thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. I mean, the Ephesians, what he's saying, they had been characterized for their love for one another. I mean, think about that too. If your love for the Lord grows cold, you know what follows right behind that? Your love for the saints. It's like suddenly you don't want to be around Christians. You're just like, they annoy you too. Not only does your husband annoy you, but they annoy you. You know, I just, I don't want to be with those people. You know, they're a bunch of hypocrites. Well, so are you. I mean, that's the thing. <laughs> We're all a bunch of hypocrites. We're all sinners in need of a savior. And if he saved us, we're, we're just, we're saved people in need of fellowship. And it's like, we have to take to heart what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount to get the log out of our own eyes so we can see clearly to get the speck out of our brother's eyes. Of course, other believers have tons of specks. Of course they do. But we got this big two by four sticking out of our heads. And God wants us to get that out. He wants us to have a love for the saints. That's the mark of a believer is someone who loves the brethren, who loves other Christians, even if they're annoying. I mean, people can annoy me, but that doesn't mean I don't love them. 
That doesn't mean I won't do for them. That doesn't mean I'm not going to be polite and kind and help them when they're in need. Because I'm sure I'm annoying to more people than annoy me, I'm sure. And even though they still, these people, had right doctrine and right life and still served God, they were missing the love for the Lord. They did not have a sincere love for the Lord, although they had had it. They didn't really love him, not the way they had loved him. We know that they did at one time because God says so. Because he says they left it. They forsook it. So they had it. So two things going on here. There's the the leaving that a believer does. He just kind of takes his salvation for granted. He just coasts along. He's learned enough now to say no to everything and sometimes look at the eagerness and love of new believers and thinks, oh, give them time. They're, They're zealous right now, but they'll get over it. Kind of like when an older married couple looks at the newly married people and think, oh, give them time. They'll get over it. You know, one of the absolute greatest compliments I ever received was from my friend, Oksana. I mean, she lived with us for a few months um, to learn English so she could translate some of things for for, um, people in Ukraine. And she spent a lot of time with me because I was helping her learn English and helping her learn how to work through some of my stuff. But she lived with us enough to see the good, the bad, and the ugly. (laughs) But one of the things she said to me after I got off the phone with Carl, she said, I hope to have a marriage like yours one day. Even after all these years, you still act like a boyfriend and a girlfriend. I was like, we do? <laughs> but I, that meant everything to me. Because we are to stay in love with our husbands. God's word teaches that. But more importantly, we are to stay in love with God. We're never to get over it. We're never to get over what he did for us and what he does for us. We are never to leave our first love. And if you have, just remember, it's not God's fault. He didn't leave you. He did not forsake you. He won't ever leave. We all know whose fault it is. Verse 5, therefore remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first. God wanted them to go back and remember, to think about it. Think about where you were when God saved you or where you were before God saved you. Think about those days. This is exactly what Paul uh, tells Titus in Titus chapter 3 when he says, tells them what they were like when they're supposed to show grace to people that they meet. Because you were just like this, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, only thinking of yourself, full of malice and envy and hatefulness. But he's telling them, Remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first. Think about it when you were first saved. And then, and how you, how how God worked in your life when you were first saved and compare it to where you are now. And of course, that in itself should cause us to feel ashamed and to want to repent and to return to the love that they had left. And we see this all over scripture, y'all. We see it in Matthew's gospel. We see it in Mark. We see it in Luke. But Matthew chapter 22, verse 37 says, And he said to them, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. John 14, verse 15, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. John 14, 21, He who has my commandments and keeps them, he is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I will love him and will disclose myself to him. That, that, just points to the fact that God is intimate with those who walk in his ways. You experience an intimacy with the Lord when you obey him. John 14, verse 23, Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our abode with him. Think about that. That's like talking about the fellowship that you experience with the Lord. 
John 21, verses 15 and 16. So when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, shepherd my sheep. I mean, he's just talking. He's, he's saying, do you love me? Do you love me? First Peter chapter 1, verse 8. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. And then in Matthew's gospel, chapter 10, verse 37. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. I mean, this is the essence of this rebuke to the Ephesians. He wants not only their service and their stand for him, because we can all check boxes of what we do for God, but he wanted their affection. He wanted their love. He wants their right actions to stem from a right heart, a heart that loves him. And then he warned them, or else I'm coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. Y'all, that's what happens to believers when they lose their love for the Lord. You just don't have that power of your witness anymore. I mean, he's telling them that if they don't respond, the light of their witness in Ephesus would be put out. He, that's what he says, I will remove your lampstand from its place. And eventually that is what happened because both the church and the city declined. And don't you wonder, I mean, you, you hear your pastor say it all the time, talking about wanting this church, Community Bible Church, to have a, you know, right now we're having a great impact for the cause of Christ by his grace. But we better not ever lose our first love. That's why your pastor always looks for the future. Like, if the Lord tarries and we're home with the Lord, what's Community Bible Church going to be like? It matters. That's why those of you who are so young here today, you hold fast the faithful word. That's why Carl invests and teaches and teaches and teaches because it's not his opinion that will change. It is the word of God that helps your convic convictions run deep. We don't want to be ho-hum. Even in this ministry that we call woman's life, it's, it's part of the overall ministry of our church. We're under the shepherding of this church. We're under the authority of this church. What we do as women in this church is underneath the authority of the shepherds of this church. And God is using what we do here as women. It's having a great impact for the cause of Christ in, in women's lives that we don't even know. But we better not ever lose our first love. And your family can have a great impact for the cause of Christ and may be having a great impact for the, for the cause of Christ right now. But you better not ever lose your first love. He who has an ear, said, the word says, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Do you have an ear? Do I have an ear? And once you come back and realize like the Shulamite, you know that he's so amazing, that he belongs to you, and he is your beloved, and he is your friend. Your love for him just deepens with time, grows more intimate, more exciting, more everything, because it's become mature. It's a sacrificial love. It's a choice to love. And that brings us to chapter 6. We called it, where is he? Remember how the daughters of Jerusalem asked two questions? What's he like? And then where did he go? They made her think about all the things that attracted her to him in the first place. And as she did that, she realized on her own where he would be. Remember? And then during that time, I gave you an assignment to go home and list all of your husband's good qualities. This was on a practical level. But again, and I think I did this, I can't remember, but the other assignment is go home and list all your Savior's good qualities. I mean, there, it's nothing but good for him. But you'll run out of ink. You'll run out of paper. You'll run out of words. You won't be able to do it. 
You go home and look up every promise to you in his word. That'll be a daunting task. And, but then you take them on. You memorize them. You meditate. You reflect just on the promises of God to you. And then in those times of doubt or those times when you're wandering, God, the Holy Spirit is faithful and he will bring to your mind all that he has said to you, everything that's hidden in your heart. You think about his love. You think about his grace. You think about his mercy. You think about where you'd be in this life without him and where you'd be in the life to come without him. That's the greater question. Think about that. And then when you wonder where he went because you feel so far away, you already know the answer to that. He'll remind you that he's right where he's always been. So when you wonder where he is, you think about him, you thank him, you draw near to him because the scripture promises draw near to him and he will draw near to you. James 4, that's what James 4 teaches. What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? It's not the source of your pleasures that, that wage war in your members. You lust and do not have, so you commit murder. You are envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, so that you may spend it on your pleasures. You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture speaks to no purpose? He jealously desires the spirit which he has made to dwell in us but he gives a greater grace. Therefore, it says God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God. Here it is. And he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord and he will exalt you. Then chapter 7, that brought us to the second honeymoon. Remember how I told you that though weddings are beautiful, they are not nearly as beautiful as a marriage that stood the test of time and a commitment that stood the test of time because real beauty emerges after heartache, after some trials, after some years. Real beauty when a couple's been together through thick and thin through years. And for the Christian, real beauty is when a man, a woman has walked with God for years has never lost their first love, or maybe they did, they went through some dips, you know, but the trajectory is upward. They may have had some struggles and and wanderings, but their trajectory is toward the Lord. And they're in love with Christ, as in love with Christ on their deathbed as they ever were, even more than when they were first saved. Because we know when God takes a believer to heaven, they don't go alone. They see the Lord, And those whose hearts beat for the Lord, even though their prayers haven't been answered the way they thought God should answer, they still love him. They still know he knows what's best. Even when they've endured heartache and trials, even when they've been lonely and they felt forsaken, not by God, of course, but by friends and family and just people in their lives. Even when they've stood alone and been ridiculed because they identified with Christ in a hard place or, or in a hostile environment. Even when they've lost a child or a grandchild or a parent or a spouse. I mean, they look to the Lord to walk them through this, to change them through it, to deepen their love for him through it way down deep. Even when disease might rack their bodies, real beauty stands the test of time. And we saw in chapter 7 a deepening intimacy between this husband and wife after they had gone through some heartache. And that's the way it's supposed to be in our relationship with God if we stay close to him and let him work and minister to us through some heartaches. We come out on the other side of every trial closer to him. That's what James says. And let endurance have its perfect result so that you may 
be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Right before that, he, that's, when he had said, that's when he says, consider it all joy, my brothers, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And that's when he adds, and let endurance have its proper result. That's what God's doing in our lives. We end up having an intimacy with him that we could have never known otherwise. And sometimes in the Christian life, We go through something with the Lord that no one else can really understand unless they've been through something very similar. But even then, it's individual the way he works on us. I mean, God presses down hard. Sometimes he turns up the heat as he refines us and he molds us and he shapes us. And as we endure the pressure We come out as gold on the other side and so close to the Lord. It's like an intimacy that you can never explain because you're so changed from the inside out and you don't even need to explain it. You just live it out. And like the Shulamite, this deepening intimacy leads us to take initiative with the Lord. (laughs) Us running to him. Us calling out to him, wanting time with him. How can I fit it in? Oh, I didn't have my Bible reading today the way I wanted to because, you know, kids were up and then I was doing this and I was doing this. But it's like, oh, I just need it. You know, he invites us all the time. Run to me, call to me, seek me and you will find me. And now you really, really want to. And you want to because you know that you just need him. And that brought us, brings us all the way to chapter 8 when I titled it, and then they lived happily ever after. <laughs> we see that deepening intimacy lead to a longing for even deeper relationship. That's the way it's supposed to be. Remember verse 5 of that chapter? Who is this coming up from the wilderness leaning on her beloved? That should be us leaning on him, coming out of our wildernesses in this life, leaning on the Lord. And of course, I also very practically asked you in that last week, in that message, you know, ever take a stroll down memory lane with your husband if you're married? Ever think about the way when you first fell in love? Well, take a a stroll down memory lane with your God. We talked, we've been talking about that today. Think about the way you were when he found you. And I referred to these verses earlier, but I want to read them to you. For we also once were foolish ourselves, this is from Titus chapter 3, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. But, there's another but, (laughs) it's the bad news, but here's the good news. But when the kindness of God our Savior and His love for mankind appeared, He saved us, and y'all, here it is again, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness. That's not why he saves us. We may think we've checked a whole bunch of good boxes, good girl boxes, but that's not why he saves us. But according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. I mean, think about how great those promises are. It's just his mercy poured out on us. And he doesn't just say, okay, well, okay, I'll save you. Let me give you a little bit of my mercy. No, he says he poured it out upon us richly. I mean, it was Christ's blood that he, Christ went to the cross and he shed his blood for us and that was a lavishing on us. And because of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, we're justified by the grace of God. And not only are we justified and made right with him, but we are heirs. We are his heirs according to the hope of eternal life. You may be the heir of your parents' estate, or you may be the heir by some some inheritance here in in this life, but God says if you belong to him, you are an heir according to the hope of eternal life. And you remember when the Shulamite said to her husband, in fact, it's right here, right here in front of you, put me like a seal over your heart, like a seal on your arm. 
And remember, a seal was used to show ownership of someone's most important treasures, what was most valuable to them. And this woman wanted her husband's seal. She wanted to know that she was his treasure, his most valued possession. But that is what we are to the Lord We are his most valued treasure. And if you don't believe me, listen to this. Revelation 4, verse 11. You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you have created all things, and for your pleasure they are and were created. God created all things for his glory and his pleasure. Did he create you? Did he? He finds pleasure pleasure in you. Isaiah 43 verse 7 says this, even everyone that is called by my name, for I have created him for my glory. I have formed him, yea, I have made him. That's what Psalm 139 tells us over and over. That's what we see all throughout scripture. If we know scripture, we are created for his glory and God counts you and he counts me as his treasure. And like the Shulamite, when we understand God's love and sacrifice for us, we should want to be completely identified with him. We, sh- we should want to be oneness in heart with him. The kind of oneness where it's difficult to tell where one ends and the other begins. And see, because of that seal of ownership in those days, could be seen by anyone what the bride was expressing then is she, she wasn't his in secret. She wasn't his secret woman. She was his in public. And because I'm going to tell you something, there are a lot of Christians today who, are, who they're fine with being called Christians when they're in church or with their when in a safe place when they're with other Christians. But out there, I don't know if I want to be identified with Christ. As I said earlier, They're afraid, well, they might think I'm weird. They might think I'm a fundamentalist. They might think I'm a freak. We're not so sure. But she was saying she wanted to be totally owned by her husband. No way any other man could get to her, steal her heart, steal her affections. He knows she stands with him. He is certain of her loyalty. He knows she belongs to him. And this is how it should be with us if we belong to the Lord 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19 says, Nevertheless, the firm foundation of God stands. Having this seal, the Lord knows those who are his, and everyone who names the name of the Lord is to abstain from wickedness. That seal, we are reminded, is a mark of ownership. We've seen this theme throughout the song. I'm his. He's mine. It's ultimate loyalty. There's no turning back. Remember that song, I've decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Though none go with me, I still I'm going to follow. No turning back. The world's behind me. The cross is before me. There's no turning back. We are to have that kind of loyalty to Christ if we belong to him. Forsaking all others as long as we shall live. And we've learned that God's kind of love is as strong as death. It's right there. Put me like a seal over your heart, like a seal on your arm, for love is as strong as death. Jealousy is severe as Sheol. Its flashes are flashes of fire, the very flame of the Lord. Many waters cannot quench love, nor will rivers overflow it. If a man were to give all the riches of his house for love, it would be utterly despised. Y'all, true love... (laughs) is a gift from God. And if you have it within you to love the Lord, it is his gift to you. God loves you. He created you to have fellowship with him, but that fellowship with him was broken when Adam and Eve sinned. But we sinned with Adam and Eve. If we had been in the garden, we would have done the same thing. We've all sinned. God is holy and perfect, and he can't allow sin into his heaven. But you and I are so very stained with sin. Nothing we can do can take care of that sin problem. No checking off the right good girl boxes because there's not one that's good. No, not one. 
And that's why God sent Christ. That's why God sent Jesus. He was the perfect man, completely God, completely man. And he went to the cross for you. If you've decided to follow Jesus, will you stand as we pray? Father, I thank you for this book of the Bible that you have given us and everything that you've taught us through it. Father, I am so grateful for the women who have been here week in and week out and have been such an encouragement to me. And Father, I pray once again for any woman who has not come into a right relationship with you, that she would conf- that she would make that right, that she would respond to your wooing, to your drawing, to your opening up her dead heart, and that she would respond to your work in her life, and that she would receive Jesus Christ, his death, his burial, his resurrection, and trust him for the gift of salvation. Father, we love you, we trust you, we thank you for all that you've done and will continue to do in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. If you enjoyed this episode of Rare But Real, be sure to subscribe so you'll be notified when a new episode is posted. And share this podcast with friends. Follow Audrey on Instagram and Facebook at Mothering From The Heart. And listen to all her messages on the Search the Scriptures app.